All right, so uh, we've got uh, the very last thing we did was some, uh, some CSS. Let's write some more CSS because we saw from the, from the example a moment ago. Okay, so the table is stretching out, but now it's not that easy to read. Well, obviously, part of the reason for that is because this white smoke background is making it hard to read. But I'm going to leave it with these colors in this setup because on the next line, here's then where we start to target the other aspects of, of that table. So we'll start again with pound div show comics table, table th. So now we're going to target the headings of the table in that div. And these are colors you'll figure out on your own later for your own version of the project. Background color, purple. And we'll do Rebecca purple. That one looks cool. And then the color of the text, white. So this is targeting the, uh, the headers in the table. <coughs> the, the individual rows of comics. I want to do an effect known as zebra striping. You've probably mm -hmm. seen what it is, maybe didn't have a term for it. Have you ever seen um, tables of information? where they alternate colors. One color is one row is one color, the next color is another color, and then the next row is another color. Different colors on different rows. They alternate. That's called zebra striping. Uh, studies show that's a lot easier to read than some simple rows that are all the same color. So we're going to say one row will be one color, another row will be another color, and back and forth, and that's more readable. We can do that via CSS by targeting the even number, the even numbered rows and the odd numbered rows. So first we're gonna target the div show comics table, the table in here, table row. Background color on that. RGB. 0, 50, 200, and the color of that text white. This, this will say every row will have a background color of whatever this color is. It's like a maroon. Every row will have that color of the background and the text. Well, the zebra striping comes in with being able to target and differentiate the even and the odd rows. So let's back up and be even more specific here. We've only said every row, every table row in the table in this div. We're going to add colon n th. This is pretty cool. Visual Studio has all these possibilities nth child, nth column, and last, nth match. It's very powerful. So we're going to say here nth dash of, and it even pops up to tell you right here, the nth type is a pseudo-class notation representing an element that has in b minus 1 siblings with the same expanded, <coughs> super, super nerdy, okay, nth of uh, type. That's the one we're going for. And it has an opening and a closing parentheses. And here we write odd. Here now we're saying, let's target a row, basically of type odd. Every odd row, odd numbered row, will have this styling. Well, we have to do something very similar for the even rows. Let's copy that whole chunk, paste it. What we need to change is now we're targeting the nth of type even. To target all the even numbered rows, change color. 
one trick that this one one trick for this to work is using the same color but fading the color out a little bit. RGB gives you a solid color. What's a way to make a transparent color? RGBA giving it a number. So RGBA with one more number, comma, 0 0.5. So for the odd numbered rows, you'll get this, this shade of color. For the even numbered rows, you'll get the same color, but faded out 50%. And so there's so many of these newer selectors that this might be like CSS3, CSS version 3. Here's a way, really smart, to, ch to check even and odd numbers. This didn't exist a few years ago. You have to try really hard to do this trick. You'd have to set so many classes individually and then set up your rule and then every time you added a new row, you had to set the new class. But if it's dynamic, well, you had to figure that out with JavaScript. This newer version of the specification of CSS has a way for us to check the even and odd rows, because it was so popular, they programmed it into the third version of CSS. At this point, we can run it. And uh, remember, you can press uh, F5. If you're, not, if you're not simulating it, you can press F5 on the keyboard, and that will select either the device or the simulator, the last thing you selected. So now if we see our table, it should be stretched out across the screen. That was the previous code. And now every other row should have an alternating color. View, view comics. There it is. So we've got, first of all, the TH row which we had Rebecca purple, which is also TR1, or odd. Then we've got, in my case, Amazing Spider-Man, that's TR even, which is the faded out color. Then we've got another TR odd, the third row, going back to the full color, and then another alternate color, back and forth automatically, as many entries as we have. That's much more readable zebra striping. So now this styling here makes the rows and such more readable. stop my simulator. I haven't seen it on my device in a little while, so for myself, I want to see it on a device. It looks fine on the browser, but I want to see it on a real device, so I'm going to switch it over to the device to see what that looks like. Right, so it's loading up on my real device. I see the splash screen for a moment. It takes a little longer than before because now we've got pouch, now we've got a lot more JavaScript. So the splash screen is there to help kind of hide it all. I'm already logged into the welcome. I'm going to view comics. I haven't saved any comics yet, so I just get the simple heading. Now here I'll save some comics. I saved a comic, I'm going to go back, view the comic, and now I've got an item there. And the icon of that uh, emoji is a little different on the device than on the browser, and that's going to be normal, depending on the device. <coughs> if 
I write the amazing Spider-Man. Number 300. Save that. Now it's there. So it's alternating the different colors, and the comic takes up the most space. Looks pretty good. Now one thing I forgot to say so far that might be useful to us is that we have our error console. For some reason on mine, it's turned off, but do you see, do you guys see a tab down here that says error list? If you see error list, let's take a look at our error list for a moment. If you don't see it, it's probably up on window or maybe view. <coughs> there it is, it's under view. So if you see a tab at the bottom left that says Error List, click on it. If you don't see it, you can go up to View Menu, Error List. I guess you can do Control Backslash E. So I'm going to pull this up to focus on it for a moment. Mine says 10 warnings. Yours may say more or less, that's okay. These are warnings, not errors. But there are some items here that might be good to, uh, to deal with. We saw this a while ago, last month, when we were first playing with Visual Studio. Visual Studio here can process our code and find errors. So the very first one here about Cordova JS not found, I'm going to ignore that. I'm going to ignore that, and there's no way really to kind of hide this message. I'm going to keep seeing it always. That's fine, because Cordova.js is dynamically generated every time we run the code. The universal selector of the asterisk is known to be slow. I'm going to leave that one. Fallback background color X should be should precede RGBA. Okay, so this one is saying fallback color. We added the RGBA, which not every device might understand. So it says don't forget to put in a non-transparent color just in case. We might deal with that in a moment. Question, Kenneth. Um, I had a question for CSS type. Um, so if we're, we don't need to set a background color for the CSS type, we can just set it to cell and all and header, right? Let's see, where did we do it? Yeah, we, we added, uh, we did it before, like at a parent level. Right here. So div show comics table. We are setting the background color of the whole table to white smoke. But then we're refining it later on. So technically by now, we, we don't really need it because we've already set up, we already said what are THs? And then we say what are our odd rows and even rows. So if those colors are taking over, we technically don't need that white smoke behind the whole table anymore. So we could remove it to save a few bytes. But I had it there a moment ago just to show here's our table and we need to refine it. All right, so this message here, okay, RGB background color fallback. I guess we should address it, but that's an issue more for dealing with older web browsers that don't understand transparency. If you really don't want to see that warning, the way we would take care of it is to define um, a plain old RGB without RGBA before it. And I don't even know what color that would be, like 100 or something. So, okay, for older browsers that don't understand, here is a plain old color. For newer browsers and newer devices, here's the transparent version. So that should get rid of the message, the nagging message right there. So uh, I probably, well, I would want to know that exact color without RGBA. I'd have to spend some time to find it later. That, that color is probably not the same color, so I'll, I'll just choose that color. So uh, Alex and Natalia, do you guys have a question? No? 
So this will take care of that message right there. Let's see these other ones. These are also warnings, but maybe it's a good idea to fix them. I don't like to see them all there. It's missing semicolon. Okay, what's that about? So you can double click. It'll jump you to the right spot. Oh, I see here, technically, we needed to have semicolons here. Because we've got it all on one line, and it would look weird to put it there. But technically, right, we've got the opening and closing curly braces, which have then a sequence of commands in between which then should be terminated with a semicolon. So it worked fine without the semicolon, but technically this is the same as, as this, if this was separated to its own line. And now that I see it that way, definitely that should have a semicolon. So don't break it to the next line if you don't want. I'm not going to. But I guess to fix that warning, which is going to be all of the rest of them, you can put a semicolon there, which looks odd because now it looks like you've got two at the end of the line. The end of the lines are just illusions for the humans. The computer will see where the line ends properly. And so my other one here. And here. And as I start saving these, these will start to go away. Basically on all of these, on all of our, our event handlers, almost all of them, I guess, we had these, wherever we had these event handlers that had an anonymous function and then our named function, we should put a semicolon there, which will look weird, but that'll get rid of that warning. And then I've got two left. And there's another one, so there's a submit form. Uh, that's an early one, and then one more. Right there, so saving all of those, I get rid of those warnings, and the last two ones are the one I'm never going to get rid of, the Cordova one, because it's dynamically generated, and you could go in and remove that one because it claims to be slow, but I'll leave it. So if, if, uh, if you guys were having trouble with some of your code not working, I forgot to mention it, the error list here can often help a lot. Let's work on adding the feedback for when you save the comic. Right now the, the feedback only appears in our JavaScript console. I want something to appear on screen for the user to let them know that they've saved the comic. We've got it set up that it just clears the input fields. They save the comic, it empties out. What happened? So they're going to try to type it again. So we want to give a pop-up message that you saved the comic. We set this up in two ways. We've already dealt with pop-ups before. We do two things. We're going to write the HTML, which is going to be what will be displayed to the person. Then we write the JavaScript that displays that to the person. So let's go back to our index file. And any, any pop-up text that we give to the user, we need to write it in the same section of, of where that's happening at. I want to go into the section of saving the comic. Section PG Save Comics. My form is there. So the form ends at about line 164. That's the input form that asks for the name of the comic, etc before the end of the article. I'm going to create a new div here with the message comic saved. This is the message that will appear when the person saves the comic. Whatever they, uh, whatever we want it to, to say. They will save the comic, this will pop up, it'll just say comic saved. In order for this to behave as a pop-up, it needs a few attributes. Data role, pop-up. Mm 
needs a class of UI-content. Without that, it will sort of be floating as a sort of empty visual element. UI content is a class built into jQuery Mobile that creates a simple background for that div. The div is automatically transparent. And we need an ID so that we can call it via JavaScript. We'll call this pop saved comic. So any pop-ups who want to display any messages, they need to be in their own div, data role pop-up. And they need to be in the same article and section as where you're trying to call them from. Okay, so we need to find the area then in our JavaScript file where we're saving our comic. We've already, we're getting down to 380 lines of code. Here is when a simple control F to find is really going to help you. Instead of scrolling around to find the right place, if you can remember some keyword of code or text or something to search for to jump to the right place, um, this will help us jump to the right spot. So we need um, fn save comic. It doesn't even need to be spelled the same. I'm starting to write fn save scene that jumps you to the right place. It can be case sensitive if you need it to be. If you turn on case sensitivity here, match whole word is another way to search more accurately, but here any instance where that string of characters appears it should take us to the right spot. So at about line 238 is where this function begins. This is where we set up to save the comic. We are going to put the comic, there could be a failure, and a lot could fail, and then we could have or else success. So. It's actually at about line 286. We have some console output. Um, we succeeded. Is I spell succeeded? Did you guys let me spell, misspell it the whole time? Okay, I'll trust you. So we succeeded, and that's going to the console, but not to the user. Then the form resets so that they can accept the new, uh, a new comic. Well. Before the form resets, this is where we want the pop-up to happen. We want the pop-up to say, comic saved. So the way this works is, with the jQuery selector, the dollar parentheses, we need to target our pop-up. So in quotes, we need the name of our pop-up, which was pound pop saved comic. So I forget these names as soon as I type them, we need to double check. Pop saved comic. Pop saved comic. All right, so we're saying we're going to use this div as a pop up. So we have to first initialize it. Dot pop up. This is just standard for jQuery mobile. We did this a while ago last month when we set up the login system. Initialize that as a pop-up. Copy that line and paste it, because then we need to actually open it up and with a couple of options. So first we 
prepare that div to act like a pop-up. Without it, the div would just automatically be visible there. It would look weird. So first we prepare it. Then we actually open it, comma, angle bracket, or uh, curly brackets, JSON formatted options that we're passing into the pop method. So in quotes, position two, capital T, colon, quotes, open. Here's the option that says, when we open this pop-up, this first part says, when we open the pop-up, position it to what we clicked on when we clicked to open. Comma, quotes, transition, colon, flip. This is a this is JSON. Right? We've got the, the, the curly brackets, key and value pairs. The jQuery mobile specification tells us what are valid options here when we want to deal with a with a pop-up. We're gonna position the pop-up to the thing that we clicked on to open it. And we're gonna have a transition and animation of a flip. You can save it and run it at this point in the browser or the device. Save a new comic, and, you'll, and you should get this pop-up that says, you saved a comic. Mm I'll run this on the simulator so that you can see it. So we'll go to the Save Comics screen. I'm going to save a new comic. Let's see, I'll save, I'll save Lobo number one, 1993 from DC. Click Save. Pop up. Comic saved. I click outside of it. Goes away. Got a new item in the in the table. Save another item, I get some feedback. I was already getting plenty of feedback in the console, now we needed to give feedback to the user. We didn't do this before in the last few weeks because now we have jQuery mobile that will create nice looking pop-ups and we didn't have that to do very easily before. Let's pause there. Did everyone get that uh, pop-up message to come back, to come out? 
What's that? It's not saving it to your table. <clears throat> Well, it should actually automatically at this point. Uh, let me test it on one, but it should, we did have an alert before. And when we had the same mm -hmm. comment, there was already an alert. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's check the on uh, the device. Because you've already saved a few examples. Without running it again on the device, we'll watch the It's 
say that the thing that the least of the gap for some reason is what I was going to say, but if you were missing the key to confidence.
All right, so um, let's set up our system for displaying all of that uh, info um, that we have floating around. Remember we had this setup that we all, we're only displaying the name and the number of the comic. We then want to click on the info icon to then display that extra info, the publisher, the year, etc. So that's going to mean we need uh, what we've left back on the notepad plus plus. The last thing that we have there, we're going to need that in a moment. So to remind you, way back on the notepad file, uh, what we left, the last thing that we left behind, we'll get to it in a moment. We need a place to put it. But back on the back in the pouch file in notepad, we need that eventually. That's what displays the name, the year, the publisher, etc somewhere. Well, we're going to combine this plus a pop-up, but a pop-up that is a little bit more fleshed out so that there's more space. The pop-up we did a moment ago is just one simple word. I want a pop-up that has more visual design to it so that we can display all of these elements there. So if you go on Visual Studio, um, we need we need to do, we, we need to set up a div as a data role of pop-up. And this is information that's going to appear in the view comics section. Let's jump back to the HTML file. We added a div of pop-up for a comic saved in the save comic 
page. In the view comics page, we're going to need something like that, but with more detail. So let's scroll down. We'll type it manually. It's not so much. So we've got the article and the actual div that displays the table on 175, and then the article ends on 176. Give yourself a new line before that article ends. This is in the View Comics, the PG View Comics section. We're going to start a div here. This div uh, data role pop up. This one's going to be a little different because it will have uh, data dialog true. The other pop-up was a, was a simple pop-up, more like a tooltip pop-up. This one will behave more like a dialog box. It needs an ID so that we can reference it. Pop. View. Comics. Info. So the whole section is PG View Comics, and this is going to be Pop View Comics Info, the detail of each comic. I'm going to break this div into separate lines so we can create a header. Break that header, data roll, header, this is a more full-fledged pop-up because it's got data dialog and more structure, so header. Here we will write an h1, comic info. and then it's article. This is the spot then where we're going to copy the code from the uh, pouch project into this new pop-up, this dialog box. If you go back to the pouch project, that div, we need that div completely. And we'll paste it in because that's what we want to display on screen like before. Previously, we had it in a very simple visual design, and um, now I want it in a dialogue. We'll add one more thing after that div. We'll add an A tag here for close. You'll get this pop-up. It'll have the detailed information about the about the um, comic, and then a close button below it. href pound to go back to the main div here. PG View Comics. Data Roll Button.
So that was the last, the last bit of code missing from the original pouch file. The there were there was a bunch of HTML and, and even more JavaScript that needed to be put into the, the right place. The last bit of that was the info div. So we put that into its own pop-up. The code to make that work, we always had it when we copied our, our whole chunk of JavaScript. So it was in there, show comics info. There was just no place to display it. It didn't exist. Div show comics didn't exist, but now now we copied and pasted it in. So we should be able to simply save all the files and, and run the simulation. You should have some comics by now to um, to to display. View comics. Let's choose any of these. Oh, wait, one more thing. Um, we are not technically triggering the display of the pop-up. We are putting the data to the pop-up that exists, but we never triggered the pop-up. We're missing what we did over here when we saved something here. Logo number 99 from 1999. This save, this pop-up, we had to trigger it. Um, so, that's what we're forgetting here. Um, Okay, we've got the div that makes the pop-up happen. Back to the JavaScript. We created this pop-up for the error message. Not the error message, the saving. Line 286. So we created the pop-up, we initialized the pop-up, and we displayed the pop-up for saving the comic. We need those, we can copy those two lines of code uh, to display this dialogue pop-up that we just made. So at about line 286 to 287, copy those two lines. So these last pop-ups that we set up, copy those, and we need to paste them and modify them when we do show comics info. Show comics info is the function that displays the the info of comics and. At the moment, it is trying to put the data in the right place, but it never displayed it on screen. We get the data, we try to display it. If there's a failure, console output, or else display it. So here's all the data being displayed. We need to paste that pop-up, this pop-up code that initializes it and then actually displays it. And we need to change the the name of the div. So that same pop-up code that worked before, it'll work here, but then we just need to change it. That's going to be set to the name of the new div we just made, which is pop view comics info.
All right, so we initialize the pop-up. We open the pop-up, the view comics pop-up. We save all of that and then simulate. Comics, add a bunch of comics, click one of them, pop up. I think there's a slight thing that needs to be changed. Oh, I, I remember what we're missing. Uh, the spacing's kind of tight. We'll fix that in a moment. So, anyway, that pops up, then you've got a close button. Click another one, shows that. If you fill it in, obviously, the more you fill in, the more it'll show you. Let's say I fill in, I'll make a new comic here. Max number 25. Image, first appearance, really important character. Save that, I get the pop up result. Go back, view comic. There's number 25 that I just added. View info, and pop up, so it goes larger. This is uh, right up to the edge because we forgot one thing. On the article that we created, we always have to add the article of UI content for that extra padding. So, uh, HTML, and here it is. We created that div, data role pop up with a header, data role header, and an article. Forgot to put the article, that's why there's no good padding there class UI content. Mm, not really. This um, this is the built-in jQuery, which actually we also have role, now that I think about it, role main. So here is the role main and the class UI content so that the article doesn't look so bumped up to the edge of the, of the dialog box. <clears throat> Now when I do the comics and click any example, there's a little bit of spacing there that was missing. So with role and, and class, the jQuery mobile class, now it looks nice. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's a goal. That's a goal, yes. Uh, we'll do it eventually. Now, there should be a way that it automatically does it, uh, so I, that is surprising that it was that small, because it is supposed to be a consistent size, but I think um, after... But we don't even need to do, actually, um, some CSS. I know built into jQuery Mobile there there should be a way that this is a consistent size and a nice big size, but I have to double check the code. Let's take a break and then uh, we'll do one more thing when we come back. Um, so it's 10.45, we'll be back at 10.55.
We have one more thing to do, and then we'll wrap up. 